Welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast examining sound and image-based cultural production. I'm your host, Paula Blair. I'm delighted to be joined by artist and activist Emma Campbell, who primarily practices photography and is the co-director of Belfast-based organisation Alliance for Choice. I'll be back after my chat with Emma with how to get in touch with us. For now, enjoy the discussion. Emma, hello. Hello. Thanks so much for speaking with us today and hopefully we'll get some interest and information about your photographic work as well as your activism. Emma, is there a particular way you like to identify yourself? Would you like to tell us how you present yourself first? Yes, I like to call myself an activist artist. I sometimes also wear an academic hat with three A's, but Mm -hmm. um, I've been on a bit of a having a child sabbatical with that but usually um, I have the three interchangeable hats of activist artist and academic if I remember correctly we first met actually at an academic conference my memory's terrible but I have a really stupid ability to be able to remember really precise things like this so we've met I think at the contemporary gendered performance and practice conference at Queen's University Belfast in 2013 it's like a lifetime ago it does doesn't it Um, and you presented on your photographic series when they put their hands out like scales. If that's not too far back ago for you, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind describing that for us and that will help us ease into the sort of work and activism that you do. Yeah, so there's three different parts to the when they put their hands out like scales and when I presented at that conference I had done the first two parts. And the very first part was a video which was a short film I think it's just under five minutes I guess it's kind of about the decision making process or I guess the internal dialogue of somebody who decides that they are living in Northern Ireland and they need access to an abortion so bear in mind I would started working on this in about 2010 Mm -hmm. and at that time the public conversation around abortion hadn't reached the almost cultural it's not like cultural acceptance now but certainly saturation like people are talking about it whether or not they agree with it it's very much on the cultural horizon at the minute but at the time it really wasn't and I wanted to show how what was in the public forum was the words of politicians which were hugely lacking in understanding which were obviously mostly and still are mostly but even more so then were mostly male voices I'd had the transcript from the 2000 assembly debate on abortion where Jim Wells basically as soon as the power got devolved from Westminster to Northern Ireland Jim Wells proposed a motion in order to ensure that the 1967 act would never be extended and that no change would ever be made to the 1860 He is definitely at the extreme end, along with a few other people. Mm -hmm. There's a quote from Ian Paisley Sr., who was still alive in 2000 at that time as well. There's a lot of quoting from the Bible, and there's one or two dissenting voices in the form of mostly women, two or three women politicians, and one man called David Irvine. In his quote, one of his quotes, he says, How on earth can we ever put ourselves in their shoes when they put their hands out like scales? and put their choices in the balance so that's kind of where that phrase came from I guess I liked it because of its image of justice and there's something very it reminded me the scales obviously can be interpreted like the scales of fish in the sea is kind of hinted at something towards the sea and travel and so after reading through and some some of the quotes weren't as great as his as you can imagine but mm-hmm. I wanted to be able to show how this is what the public conversation was on abortion mm-hmm. and this is the kind of thing that would be how we figure out what we do in the world is informed and especially something like stigma and mm-hmm. abortion carries stigma from loads of different directions and something like that would be informed by not just your own personal and close family feelings on mm-hmm. the subject but then also your wider community whether that's a church community whether that's a work community whether it's if you're in a football team or whether you're in a sewing circle whatever it is that's your slightly wider community and what they think of abortion and then there's the community at large and in our case that would be Northern Ireland and the public conversation around it was so lacking in nuance and lacking in really putting because it's mostly women but not obviously all women but women at the center of the abortion argument so Mm -hmm. the physical narrative of the piece Mm -hmm. is I guess a journey from Stormont Mm -hmm. and then through the domestic realm and then 
out to the sea. So there's a bit of, uh, I guess, using the metaphors of nature and water and all that kind of stuff. At the time, lots of people thought it was maybe too subtle. <laughs> and now looking back, compared, compared to what we can talk about now, mm. it really doesn't seem subtle at all, especially when you've got the voices of the politicians in the background. I think that was the piece that you saw at the conference. Yeah. And I was possibly still working on the photographs mm-hmm. at the time. Does that sound... Yeah, yeah. That, that you've got that video online as well, haven't you? Yes, that's um, right, yeah. Yeah, because I rewatched it again recently and I think it's even more poignant now because there's been no sitting assembly for over a year and a half. So yeah. the emptiness of the grounds of Stormont, the desolation there that you pick up in the images, I mean, it's quite a scary form of foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting because yeah. I haven't watched it recently and I'm, yeah. I must watch it now. That's yeah. really fascinating. Have a look at it again. Yeah, just the emptiness uh, of the place, you know, this place uh, of power and they're not there they're not doing their jobs and they're continuing to deflect these issues absolutely and then the next part of the series was about the actual journey and so i met with activists in london from an organization called the abortion support network and they raise money and fund women coming over for abortions and they put them up in their houses or meet them from the station or whatever help people need they were in their infancy i think they started in 2009 so they were still very new even though actions like that had happened before but there'd been a lull in the 90s and then this slightly new version of the organization came about in 2009 i used lots of the first person stories and narratives that they have and some from Anne Rossiter she's an activist who's been doing very much that work from the 70s and I retraced the steps of people so I travelled to Birmingham, Manchester Liverpool and London on bus, on boat, on plane a number of journeys, probably almost 20 journeys in total. The first journey was a bit more experimental because I didn't know what I was going to do so I took maybe four or five different cameras with me just to see what it would look like. I even had a bus thought of maybe photographing thing in my mind actually my journey was really initially to photograph the places that people stayed in Mm, when they had to go over so that was the first thing I thought of and you know I did that as well but when I got back and haven't done the journey I really really felt like the journey was the really important thing and so I made more of those journeys and I took the stories with me on the bus when I reflected about it afterwards because I come from quite a um, I guess kind of a photojournalistic documentary background Mm -hmm. was taught my undergraduate by Paul Mm Seawright and Clive Landon and people that are very much in that mold and Ken Grant thought about what I eventually did for the photographs I realized it was really a performance Mm -hmm. so like retracing the steps of women and recording that as if it was me going through it it was funny one of the bus drivers like you've been on this bus a Mm -hmm. few times are you from the you thought I was from immigration control oh right (laughs) Which is quite interesting. I really tried then to do the pictures all from, from the first person perspective. I'd been doing a lot of research about feminist photographers in the UK in the 70s and 80s, and they had lots of very core beliefs around not victimising women in photography. So if they were asked to go and make you know, if they were commissioned to photograph in inverted commas poor women in a a deprived area of London, they would engage the people that they were photographing and ask them how they wanted to be portrayed instead of just going in and then making, Mm. you know, some victim photography and othering the people Mm. that they were in the subject of the photographs. And so I guess, or I don't guess, I know that I was very, that was very much in the forefront of my mind when I was trying to do this first person thing. Whenever I produced it then, it just seemed to resonate. Now, not with everybody. Some people didn't get it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I remember showing it to creators from other countries and they were a bit confused and and I think that was because they didn't understand that abortion was illegal in Northern Ireland so in Mm. order to present the work I had to do like a 101 yeah (laughs) they were like but it's like England and you know it was a whole conversation Mm. whereas if I showed it to anyone from anyone from Ireland or Northern Ireland they just got it completely 100% no explanation needed and so I think that resonance is what helped get the show in the Copper House gallery and Les who is uh, the, one of the amazing guys Les and his partner run the Copper House gallery <laughs> when I showed him the book dummy of it he actually cried yeah. which has never happened to me in a portfolio review before <laughs> so, <laughs> normally if somebody cried at your photographs you'd be worried <laughs> but it was yeah I thought it was uh, his very emotional and unencumbered response was, yeah. was something that kept thinking that I had to keep working on mm. the project so yeah 
Wonderful. I mean, I'm just thinking back to, I'm hoping I'm not misremembering stuff, but certainly from when you're watching the video, there's a focus sometimes on the minutiae, you know, the tiny things, the tiny seemingly incidentals. And it just made me think about if you do go on a journey like that, that where you're maybe being very pensive, very thoughtful, it's a huge thing in your yeah. life to do. What is it that you focus on and what then do you remember about that day? Do you remember those? You know, I yeah. think you clutch on to those tiny things, how the raindrops yeah. fell, you know, for example, that sort of thing. Yeah, there's definitely a sense of, especially when you read the stories. So these people are going through something that for some of them, it's an easy decision as in they very much know what they want to do. Mm-hmm. But because of the stigma surrounding it, it makes it cloak and dagger. Obviously, it's about your body. So a lot of people forget that while women are needing access to abortion that means they're pregnant mm. and early pregnancy even very early pregnancy can carry a lot of symptoms so you're experiencing this very bodily physical mm-hmm. thing that you're going through like some people have to pretend not to experience more than sickness mm. in order to hide their early pregnancy so that people don't know that they're going for an abortion if that mm-hmm. makes sense all of this is going on and then at the same time you're having to think about getting to a city that you've maybe never been before making mm-hmm. sure you get off the right stop on the bus make sure you've got your passport and all of these extra things that some people would find stressful just to go on a mini break (laughs) never mind Mm -hmm. to be going while you're feeling the effects of early pregnancy while you're doing something that's heavily stigmatized and while you're doing something that is considered not just stigmatized but considered illegal in your own country so you do get a sense from the stories they worry about the abortion on one hand but in actual fact many of them talk about not knowing how to use the tram system or not knowing if they were at the right because there's like two stations in Liverpool and there's a million stations in London so not mm-hmm. knowing if they were at the right station or what ticket to get and there's definitely that kind of worry about the detail comes through and you know if people have made the decision to make the journey you also get the sense that yeah. they've made this decision we're complicated human beings so we will have lots of different feelings about that decision but mm-hmm. they've definitely made their mind up when they're going on this journey so the feelings that come through are are especially when people are retelling their story afterwards it's like why did I have to do that in another country why did I have to go mm. through that journey why did I have to be miscarrying on the yeah. on a plane or a boat on the way back to Northern Ireland or Ireland and I was trying to put myself as well you know there's also this very common like an, a thing in the Irish and Northern Irish psyche of travel of emigration there's somebody in everybody's family who's moved away to work Mm -hmm. you know you're not living in Northern Ireland I didn't live in Northern Ireland for 10 years Mm -hmm. and there was something very familiar as well in making the journey because I would have in my early 20s I would have made the cheapest possible journey which would have been a 17 hour bus journey from London or whatever as I got older and earned more money I was able to fly occasionally but it meant that the physical journey was something that I felt would be easy to identify with for for anyone in Ireland and Northern Ireland for other reasons that are tied to Mm -hmm. problems with how we are treated as citizens or what's available to us as citizens isn't just even about abortion one of my tutors said to me you do realize you're trying to photograph something that's unphotographable Mm. which felt like them throwing down the challenge that's a challenge (laughs) that's the gauntlet yeah (laughs) so i suppose i was trying to think of the photographs um some of them feel like maybe slightly psychogeographical some of them feel very dark and very trapped and then some of them feel a bit freer and a bit more like breaking away I think that's certainly what it was trying to do and then the ones on the bus you know you're just there for if you're doing it by bus you're, do, you're there for hours and hours and hours and beside you'll be different people and you're wondering why everybody else is on the bus mm-hmm. and and also the stories where people were like I wonder does every, they had this feeling that somehow everybody knew yeah. why they were travelling so there was all all those different factors I guess at play mm-hmm. and I was trying not to be too literal as well mm-hmm. on top of that <laughs> looking at them I feel it captures all that range of things the imposed feeling of shame that you have or that you imagine that it should be shameful or back to those really mundane stretches of time and the nothingness that's happening and you can't really settle to do anything and the tiredness of it it's a tiring thing to do even if you do travel for pleasure as you say or when I was living in Belfast I was back and forth to 
written for job interviews and for conferences for research whatever and yeah. so you do when you do see those images you do relate to just the act of the journey the travel yeah. um you know so i think that absolutely comes across very well um <laughs> And I suppose then to move on then from journeys, but then the other element of journey being identification and passport photos. And then mm. so another project you've done is the passport butterflies. Yes. Mm-hmm. It was hard to get from one to the other. There was another project in between that maybe wasn't as successful. So mm-hmm. I felt I was talking very much about an individual's experience with the first project. And then the second project, I'd had an offer from Women on Web who Mm -hmm. provide abortion pills to countries where it's illegal. And they'd done a few big actions and they'd said I was allowed to go and use their photo archive and do whatever I wanted with it. (laughs) So I couldn't really turn down the offer. You know, it was a great offer and I got to go to the, it's called Atria, A-T-R-I-A, and it's this fantastic library or archive of gender studies and history and emancipation of women in Amsterdam because women and women are based in Amsterdam I used their images and some of them were very you know taken on low quality digital cameras back in the early 2000s so the quality wasn't great and I was like how am I going to make this into something interesting and so I made them into collages with historical images from the National Library Archives of Ireland from around 1861 so Mm. around when the act was I guess I was frustrated that a lot of the interaction you would get on talking about abortion in Ireland and Northern Ireland was bearing on racism it was almost like those stupid patties can't put anything Mm. out and those comments definitely happened and I got interviewed on The Guardian or whatever or was doing a or something in the media that was printed in England that would have come up quite a number Mm. of times I guess I was trying to think of a way to deal with that so I was using the archive images to maybe speak a little bit about the idea of the Irish native Mm -hmm. in inverted commas but also the impact of colonialism because obviously the original law is a British law and there was no law before that so talk a bit about that the collage you know I'd done collage years and years ago but hadn't done that in years and so it was a bit of an experiment but it it didn't really resonate I still enjoy some of the images but um, I don't think it resonated with people who didn't know enough about it it almost required you to do a little bit of reading before looking at the pictures and that for me meant that maybe there was a bit of a feeling in the project Mm -hmm. but the project after that was the passport photographs and it was out of the idea of in the first project I, I'd been so careful on worrying about stigmatising people in the pictures then I worried that I was making the woman invisible in it or was you know was I making the woman invisible in it or right. was I making the abortion seeker invisible in it and so I also realised from an interview I'd had with a student actually who'd said I, I've noticed that the pro-life side you know they use the fetus imagery they use images Mm-hmm. Of, of women being mothers a lot but mostly fetal imagery of a giant completely out of proportion yeah. fetus blown up apparently floating in space or you know creepy things like a, a pretend hand coming through the belly a lot of pro choice or pro reproductive justice imagery is really beset by an awful lot of text so it's this difficulty of how do you make something that's visual Mm -hmm. and talks about the people that need access to abortions or talks about the people that are involved in fighting for access to abortions and so I originally thought maybe I'll get people to send me their passport photographs I'll do something with them and I hadn't really thought of what I was going to do yet the first picture I kind of tried with was Savita Halapanavar Mm -hmm. which was the woman who died in Galway of sepsis when they wouldn't treat her because she was 17 weeks pregnant and she clearly started to have an early miscarriage but because they could still detect a fetal heartbeat they wouldn't Mm. treat her and also there was an element of racism in that story because they told her this was a Catholic country her family had given explicit permission to activists to use her image so that it would never happen again essentially Mm. and so I tried with hers but I felt like her image was used so much Mm. already the reason I was using it was because it it had been used so much in placards cards and posters and stuff around the pro-choice argument and I I felt like it had been used loads because the pro-choice side as it were had a dearth of imagery that they Mm. could use and so then that's when I thought about getting activists to send me Mm. their postcard images and I did various things with them I chopped them up (laughs) I <laughs> laid things over the top of them. When I was re-photographing them, I then realised, you know, the contemporary way of doing photographs of yourself is a selfie. It's 
very kind of Instagram and current activism is very more what people would call a fourth wave. Feminism has a huge focus on social media and the sharing of images and memes and that kind of thing. And maybe I could use this form to better illustrate the idea that there are it was trying to insert not necessarily but powerful insert powerful images of activists and abortion seekers because there aren't any (laughs) and and so had loads of volunteers and i photographed people at marches and i photographed people at pro-choice events sometimes i specifically did a call out and people called around to the studio and then i either asked them to tell me something about their activism or i used something about abortion activism in the time and i used three different apps <laughs> mm. to then do like a digital symmetrical image of the person in which i overlaid elements of activism or elements of the abortion rights struggle over mm-hmm. the top of them the reason i thought of the whole the butterflies thing was partly to do with my with my research hat on I was looking into the relationship between feminism and photography feminism as we know it so feminism from if we imagine that it began with the suffragettes even though we know there were feminists before that and they Mm -hmm. would describe themselves as feminists etc etc but if we imagine the suffragettes as the start of a countrywide movement and an international movement around feminism then photography was born at the same time so photography and feminism for me felt like two tenets of modernity the first ever color photograph was taken by robert maxwell and it's a little tartan like a rosette almost Mm -hmm. looks like a political rosette Mm -hmm. it looks really like bug like or butterfly like Mm -hmm. i'd also had the fortunate visit to a natural history unit in harvard i have a friend who married a research scientist (laughs) he's doing his phd in harvard so i don't know how else she would get into this particular (laughs) place but they had rows and rows of cases of bugs and butterflies and things and obviously lots of them had been collected in the 1800s i started to make these connections about how also the suffragettes were the first ever political group to be under political surveillance by the state Mm. The Met Office in London bought state-of-the-art at the time camera because all the cameras up until then to be very still in order to get the clear picture because mm-hmm. the exposure times were so long. The suffragettes knew this and they would shake their head vigorously yeah. so that they couldn't get an accurate representation. So whenever this new camera was developed, I can't remember the name of it. Mm-hmm. It's in my essay, but they had a guy hide, the Met photographer hide in a van in the Royal Holloway Women's Prison to get accurate likenesses of them and then once they realized that this camera way they were able to do a much better surveillance option on the suffragettes and although they were being watched in this way the suffragettes also knew the power of the image and very much like very much so you know there's an awful shame that so much of the artistic links in the suffragette movement and the militant links have been dumbed down for Mm -hmm. historical narratives on what the suffragettes were but they very much knew the power of art and image and they had chapters of craftswomen and chapters of seamstresses and artists and there's an interesting link because arts were often the first third level education establishments that women were allowed into so it makes sense that a lot of the suffragettes a lot of the early suffragettes came from an art school background they used imagery and they there's a the first ever woman press photographer is a woman called christine broom who worked at the same time as the suffragettes and she did these fantastic images of their marches and all the pageantry and they asked her to be there they knew they were going to get great pictures because she did pictures of military parades mm-hmm. they totally knew and in a way like a modern day of a press call you know a modern day of asking a photographer to turn up to your protest or mm-hmm. your rally and so that you know they knew the power of the image and so I wanted to combine all of these thoughts in my head Mm. head, (laughs) into one image. Because the law is from 1861, Mm -hmm. photography was invented. Our color for this color photograph, I think it was 1836. And then the suffragette movement was nascent at that time. So all of these things felt like a really good mix Mm -hmm. or place to make something out of. And that's where I came up with the idea of making the passports into a butterfly collection. I thought there was something powerful about the act of putting the pin through the woman it felt like it very easily showed this act of state violence that denying women abortions was about this appropriateness of sexual behavior appropriateness of public conduct and all of these i think almost like a hangover from a victorian era it's still this victorian law that we're living under it spoke about surveillance because lots of people like us who are doing political work 
because also in my activism I do lots of actually on the ground political stuff like clinic defending and escorting women to and from Mary Stopes or helping women find out how they can get access to abortion pills and we knew that lots of us had our addresses watched we mm-hmm. then knew this for certain when some of us had our offices and workspaces raided on mm-hmm. International Women's Day two years ago and so it felt like everything came together for me in my head in this one idea and I'm still making them so originally I wanted to make 12 because it was 12 women a week at that point that travelled mm-hmm. from the whole of Ireland and then one I was very quickly and easily got 12 people <laughs> I was like right, I'll make 40 because or sorry it was 12 women a day and then it was 40 women a week and now I've been to international conferences and I've mm-hmm. taken photographs of people there it kind of hints a bit more at the global struggle as well I've taken photographs of men mm-hmm. who are activists but I still haven't made them into butterflies because I'm not sure what to do with that yet or whether it needs to be something slightly different yeah the butterflies is still in progress as in i'm still trying to get as many women as possible i've reached out to some colleagues and comrades who were canvassing and working really hard in the run-up to the referendum i didn't want to ask them in the middle of it all because it was it was a very full-on time very intense but some of them got back to me now and i've got some of their images as well there's some people that i feel like the project won't be finished unless i've got them in it (laughs) You know, I can't put in every activist, but there's some people I feel like I can't miss out. Yeah. yeah. And I want to make sure that, that I have, you know, black women's bodies and immigrant women's bodies yes, in there. Yeah. I want to make sure that there's trans men yes, in there. Exactly, I want to yeah. make sure that there's non-binary people in there. I want to mm-hmm. make sure that the piece is as intersectional as our activism tries mm-hmm. to be. I've shown it in very old etymology boxes and I've shown it in modern versions. And then online, I guess they just look like portrait images. But interestingly, the images have already been used. There's a researcher called Sally Sheldon at the University of Kent. She did a research paper called Can the State Control Swallowing? And it was about access to abortion pills. And so she didn't know what image to use and had contacted me after mm-hmm. she interviewed me as one of the activists for her books and then contacted me about using some of the images so it's been used for that and then also there's a book that's just out called reimagining global abortion politics okay they've used a selection of the butterflies on the front of that so i thought that was great <laughs> i haven't even finished yet it sounds like there's an awful lot in those images and there kind of is but it sounds like they need an awful lot of explanation but actually when people see them they don't oh, you know yeah. they don't need the explanation like the last one so they're very layered there's a lot of texture in yeah. them there's a lot to you don't just sort of flick through them you can actually stare at one for quite a long time and get a lot of information from it you know yeah because i should say as well that i I make sure that there's a magnifying glass there because they're, you know, they are the size of passport photographs, so right. you do need to get very intimate with them. <laughs> yes, oh, that's fascinating because I've only seen them online, so they're bigger online. But that actual act of peering at them probably would be quite performative mm. and meaningful. When I was reading online about it as well, I've written the words down an appropriate hobby, like the idea of butterfly collecting being an appropriate yeah. hobby for a woman as well. Yeah. Especially if you were an unattached or a single young <laughs> lady. Especially, you know, the aspiring middle classes that somehow butterfly collecting was one of the things that young single women were allowed mm. to do. <laughs> you know, it seemed befitting. And there's something about it as well that talks a lot about femininity. I think, you know, it's yeah. talking about expressions of femininity or what is feminine that's kind of encapsulated, especially in an animal or a creature like a butterfly. Partly because the work is about what it's about. It's not an unbiased, I've never tried to say that this is an unbiased piece of work, mm-hmm. neither is there. It's very much coming from a very clearly stated position. Yes. <laughs> and I've never made the work. Like when they were in Copper House Gallery, I didn't have any prices or anything on them because I want people to access the images and use them because of what they are and make it easy to access for people. I think as well, it's important to note, I think you touched on this earlier as well, the difference between those images because uh, like a lot of the faces in them are smiling faces, they're happy faces, they're trying to help people yeah. faces, we're human too sorts of faces. That in contrast with the utter violence of the anti-choice postering and that kind of thing it's a real tonic in a way and I hadn't really thought actually about the idea that there weren't really images attached to a pro-choice 
movement i think somebody like savita risks becoming a martyr figure she was yeah. the person there's something else interesting so i feel like it's a whole other i want to do a paper on it just itself but <laughs> i think there's something in the idea that once this new this new version the tv version of the handmaid's tale was made oh yes then uh-huh. you see versions of that red and white outfit mm-hmm. for abortion or reproductive justice or even mm. feminist uh, sexual violence this image has now brilliantly become a kind of shorthand for state oppression of women Mm -hmm. and it's great because we haven't really had anything else like i can't think of anything quite so powerful and the other thing about it is it doesn't limit you to a race or a gender Mm -hmm. even necessarily again the way the eagerness in which that image has been taken up and used i think shows how much something like that is needed Mm. (laughs) how much more of these images are needed absolutely i haven't seen any episodes of the handmaid's tale and i haven't read the book but i know what that image is you know it's so distinctive you see it and you go oh right that it's okay oppression you know you just associate that language with the image of the types of cloaks that the women are made to wear yeah it's done really well i think the other thing about the butterflies which i hadn't mentioned is that now especially with the result in ireland Mm -hmm. my ideal (laughs) version of exhibiting them would be to have like almost like a swarm of butterflies so that I've got <laughs> so many because you know it really felt that we started activism whenever we had around us in 2010 that there would maybe be five or ten people would turn up to a meeting sometimes if something hit the news we'd get more people mm-hmm. but then it would fade away again very quickly and then we saw over the last nearly a decade now we saw this gradual but steady progressive movement and lots of young women involved in the movement lots of feminists who were involved in the 70s coming back and rejoining the mm-hmm. activism it really feels like it's galvanized a whole not just a generation a whole swathe of women and trans men and other abortion seekers all over ireland and northern mm-hmm. ireland and it suddenly feels like we're at that tipping point where we can't be ignored anymore yeah. and i think what i want to get out with the next few showings hopefully of the butterflies is that feeling the feeling that we're everywhere now mm. <laughs> you can't ignore us yeah and they're taking flight i suppose is a, another metaphor that could be yeah. used there that the almost well, I'll, like I'll show you I'll mm-hmm. send you one of the images from the recent exhibition which was on that framework I don't know if you know oh, in East right. Belfast yes yes I know yeah. One, yeah and it was a group show I'm a part of Array which is a studio group in Belfast mm-hmm. and we had a studio show there and I did one frame of them sitting in a very small kind of formation and then the next frame I tried to have it so that they were all trying to burst out of the frame once I had some of them Mm. outside of the frame and some of them just directly onto the wall Mm -hmm. it was kind of testing that idea yeah I think it worked and I think the Mm. next exhibition like I'm gonna play a bit more of that yeah yeah there's that idea as well pushing through a border (laughs) which is something that is needed at the moment as well now that the Republic of Ireland (laughs) As legalising abortion so that Northern Ireland's this tiny little blob of people not getting health care that they need. Um, the awareness has really risen. I mean, living in England for four years now, mm-hmm. when I was teaching in universities, it was shocking how little students know about Northern Ireland in general. In uh, general? Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and ha- me having to explain to them I'm from the same country as you so that in a broad sense but also them not knowing that abortion was illegal in part of the UK. Some students would find that quite distressing you know and whatever their own story was the idea that they could if something happened unexpectedly that they could sort that out and they had options they had choices if they got pregnant during their studies whatever the idea that they wouldn't be able to do that was very distressing to them and so they would actually then start to talk to their friends about that you know and it was really wonderful to see that awareness spread in Britain. I think there's a wonderful and delicious irony in Mm. the fact that the DUP you know we know nobody ever really publicly states it but we know that they're not sitting here because they're enjoying wagging the tail of the dog too much in Westminster. The spotlight that was shown on them whenever it was clear that Theresa May needed them for the Mm -hmm. parliament actually kind of bit them in Mm. the ass because (laughs) 
it's shone a light on gay marriage or yeah. the lack of it. It's shone a light on the fact that they haven't been sitting in government. It's shone <laughs> a light on the fact that even people who were Tory supporters and traditionally seen as leaning towards the right in the UK mm. were aghast to be associated with them. And the brilliant timing of Stella Creasy yeah. trying to get the amendment onto the Queen's speech, which forced the hand of the government to say, oh, join with the DUP won't make us any less pro-choice and in a way the DUP accidentally gave us funding access in mm. England so mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> obviously we've been working very hard in the background to make sure the conditions were right but once mm. they were it was brilliant and I think it also shines a light on like devolution in Northern Ireland as we know is very different to devolution in mm. Scotland and Wales mm. and I think Brexit and these issues have shone a light on how dysfunctional that actually was and how much really the the Westminster government were always just trying to ignore it and hoping that it wouldn't cause any difficulties. And you know, comments from recent secretaries of state, like Theresa Villiers, saying things like, you know, when she was talking about legacy issues mm-hmm. and saying that, you know, eventually Northern Ireland is just going to have to get over it. And there's even a sense from her, like, mm. and I find it having also lived in England and then watching programs where they talk about the history of the conflict, it's very clear that there's no consideration of what the British government's role actually yeah. wasn't that you know and I'm speaking as somebody who grew up in East Belfast yeah, in a yeah. from a Protestant around who's the people I grew up around were all unionists mm-hmm. all very much wanted to be part of the union but I think it very much shows that there's no teaching of Irish and Northern Irish history and that shows to me that it's still a colonial block it's still something that they haven't dealt with properly and yeah. again with Brexit and everything it's just showing how foolish and how and, and it, I don't know if you remember the quotes from Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg about the border like clearly they have no idea oh, what they're talking yeah. about yeah. <laughs> Oh dear. So yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's funny how abortion now is kind of in the mix of all that. Whereas beforehand, it would have been one of those things of yeah, we'll sort out your oppression after we worry about this other all these other types of oppression, you know. Yeah. And there's always something whereas, bigger. Whereas now, I feel like it's absolutely seen as something core and central to the values of the DUP versus the values of um, everyone else, you know, <laughs> the people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If there's anything else you think you would like to say, please do. If you want to plug websites, pages, any publications or your exhibitions coming up, please work away. Just that book, Reimagining Global Politics. And then there's another one. I did lots of collaborations with Siobhan Clancy and we co-wrote a chapter on art and activism in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Brilliant. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to chat with me about all this. It's been really fascinating. The problem is, as as you've discovered, because I don't get to talk about it very often, once (laughs) you ask me a question, I'm I'm off for like 10 minutes. Oh, that's (laughs) ideal. I suppose then you get a lot of questions about the activism part, not so much about the art part of what you do. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Definitely. Whereas I'm trying to do it the yeah. other way around. <laughs> um, no, it's good to do it the other way around. Like, for change. Because yeah. I'm just off. Once I get off the phone to you, then I have to do boring. What I call invisible activism. So right. sending emails to people, booking things, all that stuff that has to happen. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point as well, actually, to raise. Like, because uh, maybe there are things that a lot of us do. Are those invisible? The boring online or just talking to people and the unseen work. It's always important to remember that people are doing unseen seen things as well as very visible active things yeah too. like tonight so i'm getting ready to do a workshop with kelly o'dowd tonight there's a few women's groups that we have some connections with because we did suffragette workshops with them well they were called challenges and choices of the 21st century and mm. it kind of teaches them about feminism but now we're going back to do a much more and the reason we do it is because the last stage in the course it's a six-week course talks about abortion and reproductive rights because we felt like especially a lot of the working class areas you couldn't Mm -hmm. just go in the first week and say right we're going to talk about abortion we had to introduce ideas of autonomy and remove the stigma of the word feminism Mm -hmm. (laughs) first but anyway one of all the groups by the end but loved it and we got funding with the open university to do more workshops with people with an exhibition we were part of called my body my life so it 
travelled all around the UK and included my journey photographs. Great. And uh-huh. I was in London at one point as well, in um, Foils, I think it was. And there was a booklet produced from it that had individual stories in it, and it's stories from all over the UK, including Northern Irish stories. We're going to do a Northern Ireland specific booklet, but the brilliant thing about this, in a way, is that having the Northern Irish stories in there shows you how much more of a struggle and how you create trauma out of making people travel. So we're, we're doing a workshop with one of these groups tonight and they're apparently they're all excited about it because it's been like a year and a half since the last workshop so oh lovely <laughs> so yeah that'll be fun and it's do you know what see compared to teaching in an mm. underground environment sometimes you would do presentations in an underground environment and literally get nothing back yeah. <laughs> and, uh, when you go into these workshops you can't shut them up for questions and t- them telling each other stories yeah. and it's just it's so brilliant I just Fantastic. love it yeah what happened with us straight after the referendum was unbelievable like yeah. I have prepared for it. I remember when I booked a family holiday to Lanzarote and I mm. gave myself a week after the referendum to tidy all the bits up and, you know, give it enough time. Just, oh, that mm. is the opposite of what happened. We had to temporarily recruit eight other media, wow. media people for Alliance for Choice. It was literally everybody's phone off the hook for two weeks and, and donations coming in and, mm. and lots of shout outs from activists in the south and then a bit more awareness from feminists in England as well so yeah. I think that's really really helpful we send stuff over to the London Irish group and they sell it for us we also put their events out in our email group and a lot of our email group will be because we were at the Labour Party conference last year so lots of our supporters are actually English as well yeah. on our mailing list I have to say a lot of my tears and the run up to the referendum and after the referendum have actually been tears of people's amazing kindness and people suddenly saying oh such and such has donated you know whatever it was like mm-hmm. over canvassing somebody's donated a box of sandwiches just stuff like that that happened that was just so lovely that's fantastic all right well, so, it was very enjoyable so thank you very much thank you so much <laughs> for doing it it was great Many thanks again to Emma for helping us begin to think about art and activism and the ways that the personal is often the political. You can learn more about her work and see examples on Emma's website at emmacampbell.co.uk and I've included links to many of the other artists, scholars and organisations Emma mentioned in the extended show notes available for patrons via patreon.com forward slash PEA Blair. Suggestions for topics to be added to our list or if you'd like to be a guest we are at av cultures on twitter and facebook and our email is audiovisualcultures at gmail.com thanks so much for listening and for all your support all the best and catch you next time